all water on this planet is recycled water. The water that we are using today is the same water used millions of years ago by the dinosaurs. So we are literally capturing the wastewater for the building, we're treating it, and then we're actually recycling it back into the building for non-drinking uses. It is nasty in people's heads. Scientifically, there is nothing wrong with it. In fact, the water that we're producing is clean enough to drink. The number of people who told me with no hesitation that what we were trying to do would never happen or that was technically infeasible. And I think I'm lucky that I grew up in a household of refugees and immigrants in this country who know what challenges look like, who have been through a lot of adversity. And I think that honestly, one of my secret weapons is that I'm not easily phased. Welcome to another episode of Liquid Assets, where we talk about the intersection of policy, management, and technology as it looks at this most amazing thing, water. Today, we have an awesome guest for you. Uh, we have Aaron Tartakovsky from Epic Clean Tech. My name is Aaron Tartakovsky. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Epic Clean Tech, uh, and we are trying to start a water reuse revolution in real estate. Um, Aaron, why don't you just go ahead and kind of tell us what you're working on? Let's go ahead and dive right into what Epic Clean Tech does, um, where you guys are located, and what you're working on. Absolutely. Well, first of all, good to see you again. It's been, it's been a few years, Ravi, since you and I last spoke. Uh, we were on a panel together, actually, I guess, get discussing water, uh, which is no surprise, I'm sure. Uh, so Epic Clean Tech, we are a water technology company based in San Francisco, and we are deploying water recycling systems into real estate. Uh, and so what we're really talking about is large residential buildings, commercial buildings, you know, office buildings, industrial data centers, any building that is using a lot of water. Uh, those are places where we can help. So we are literally capturing the wastewater for the building, and that could be gray water, which is from showers, laundry, bathroom sinks. It can be black water, which includes toilet water, kitchen sinks and dishwashers, rainwater, stormwater. Taking all of that water that you would typically send off into the sewer, we're treating it and then we're actually recycling it back into the building for non-drinking uses. So think irrigation, cooling, laundry, uh, toilet flushing. By doing this, we can actually help a lot of these buildings to recycle up to 95% of their water. And so framed differently by bringing us in, these buildings are now pulling in 95% less pristine drinking water from the city supply and instead are reusing that water right on site, right at the source. Awesome. That's super, super great. Because I actually had um, somebody in earlier that was just talking about quantity of water that we have available with like groundwater, with surface water. Um, so this is actually a perfect kind of dovetail into that. Um, I want to kind of go into really quickly, you've said this at the very beginning, who are the largest users of water, right? You guys are in the built environment. Um, where are you guys targeting? You had said data centers, um, the large commercial. Do you have kind of a, a Pareto of like, these are the five bullet points. These are the five organizations, building types, business types that we basically target. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, as, as we know, single biggest user is going to be ag. Um, ag is going to be, uh, it's going to dwarf everyone else. But, um, I mean, there, there's a big mix, you know, because you can have a massive food and beverage facility that's using a lot of water in a smaller building. So really it's going to depend on the size of the building. But you know, I will say typically we do see that something like a cooling tower is oftentimes the single biggest user of water, uh, in a real estate project. And so that can be, you know, a facility that, you know, a food facility that has cooling needs. Uh, it can be just a large office building in a hot place that has a large cooling tower, or it can be, you know, as I mentioned, data centers use a huge amount of water to actually cool uh, these this critical infrastructure. The average data center uses about the same amount of water as a 50,000 person city. Wow. And as we know, the world uh, is increasingly data hungry. You know, all of this technology, even this, this platform that we're using right now requires data. Uh, it's stored in the cloud. That all requires data centers. Data centers are being built at an extremely fast clip. And oftentimes we're building data centers uh, in places that's, that have water scarcity issues, uh, like here in the Western United States. So uh, there's a pretty wide definition of, in terms of who are the biggest water users. But I think that the number I often reference is that buildings globally use about 14% of all of our potable water. Almost no buildings reuse that. That's the central problem that you know we're trying to tackle as a company. Awesome. And I've I've heard this question a few times. 
of like black water and gray water recycling is nasty, right? You said earlier, we're not using it for drinking water, but um, even in your laundry, like how does the filtering and cleaning process work for the, for the folks that have that question of, is it, is it nasty to take the water from my toilet, recycle it, and then use it for my, um, it is nasty in people's heads. Uh, scientifically, there is nothing wrong with it. In fact, you know, the water that we're producing, we're only reusing it for non-potable applications just by regulation. But scientifically, this water that we produce is clean enough to drink. In fact, and we can talk more about this, we actually produced a beer uh, from the treated gray water from one of our buildings. We we took about 2,000 gallons of treated water from, from a 35, or sorry, a 40-story high rise in downtown San Francisco. This is water from showers, it's laundry from bathroom sinks. Put it through our purification process, tested it. Uh, and once we were able to show that this is exceptionally clean drinking, drinking quality water, uh, we part of the local brewery, we made this beer. Uh, that beer, much to our surprise, went kind of viral. Uh, mm. I mean, to date, it's clocked about 1.5 billion media impressions just in the last wow. eight months. Um, now, unfortunately, we are not selling that beer. Uh, so there was maybe an opportunity lost there. Um, but look, we, we are, we're certainly not strangers to the fact that people are uncomfortable with the concept of ever recycled water. Um, they think that it is lesser, uh, that it is unclean. And I think it's, it's really a, a perception issue. It's, a, it's completely a mental perception issue. Uh, it's what we call in the industry, the yuck factor. But, you know, as I often tell people, all water on this planet is recycled water. You know, the water that we are using today is the same water used millions of years ago by the dinosaurs. Uh, it's how I explain this whole world to my nieces as well. But it's those kinds of basic concepts uh, that are increasingly important to, to convey to folks. Because I think now I'd like to point out that we we trust science and technology to fly our claims, to produce the life saving uh, medications and equipment that we use every day to I mean, here in San Francisco to guide the driverless vehicles that are increasingly taking over our roads. Uh, I think it's time that we start getting more comfortable with that same level of science and technology being able to produce clean water. But um, all that being said, I, I understand that we have to pe meet people where they are. And, and frankly, that's a big part of what we do as a company is beyond just the technology is really on the communication front, trying to convey these complex topics into, you know, much more easy to understand ways. So let's, let's actually double click into that then. What, from a communication standpoint, what have you found that works from a messaging standpoint? I think that's super interesting from a storytelling perspective. And it's brought up a ton actually on this podcast that people just all the way from water quality to water quantity, they just don't understand. They don't have their fingers on the pulse. And so a lot of it does break down into communications and messaging. What does that uh, look like from an Epic Clean Tech perspective? How many hours do we have for this? Oh my gosh. Yeah. We could, uh, maybe, maybe bring <laughs> into, a, into a 10 hour segment. Yeah. What would you, uh, what would you say? Yeah, what's the, uh, what's the summary there? Yeah. Look, look I'm, I'm going to use myself as an example. Um, you know, I entered into the water industry nine years ago. Uh, and I, I previously worked in federal politics. Like the average person, I went, or, I, I went about living my life without really ever having to think about water. And again, I'm going to caveat that with saying that this is a very much a privilege living in. United States thing to say, because around the world, not everyone has that, lives that same reality. But, um, you know, we live in a flush and forget society. You know, we have designed our infrastructure to be, I mean, effectively invisible. We buried under our streets. We put facilities away from population centers. It is very literally out of sight, out of mind. And it's a marvel of modern engineering. Our systems have historically been designed so well that we don't have to think about these things. Now, unfortunately, as we know, you know, a lot of this infrastructure was installed 30 to 100 years ago. It needs to be upgraded. It needs to be repaired. It needs to be maintained. Um, and that's kind of what we're, we're at this kind of, kind of coming to a head right now where all of this infrastructure needs to be fixed. So kind of coming back to me, coming into this industry, not a topic I really felt a lot about. And once I got deeper into it and I started hearing about, you know, the price tag to overhaul all of our water and wastewater infrastructure, you know, the, the urban population growth that we're grappling with, climate change basically adding a lot of extremes to all of this conversation. Um, I was pretty surprised at, and, and honestly a little bit embarrassed about how little I knew about it. And so I think the way we've approached this as a company uh, is kind of putting ourselves in the shoes of people for whom this is not a topic that they're very familiar with. And, and again, I think something that's 
unique about us is that a lot of water technologies, uh, not all, but a lot, sell to municipal utilities. You are selling to a very educated buyer who knows all the acronyms, who knows the industry jargon. You know, we are working with extremely sophisticated building building owners and developers and architects and engineers, but they, like the, like the general public, have designed their buildings for centuries that we put water, we pull water in and we send wastewater out. So all of a sudden when we come in and say, you know, hey, we want to recycle wastewater in your building and put it back up in your pipes, that understandably touches on that yuck factor that we talked about earlier. And so I think everything that we do as a company is just really speaking simply, not using a lot of jargon. And, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of interesting science just in terms of the word that you use. I mean, even calling, rather than calling it reclaimed water, calling it purified water. Again, exact same thing, but just that little change makes people a lot more comfortable with it. And so I think, you know, again, this is like a whole nother area that we as a company are really fascinated by is the science communication, the science of language to get people comfortable with uh, a topic like water. Do you have any more tactical examples on kind of things you've changed? I think that's, that's an amazing example of turning reclaimed into purified. Um, anything else that comes to kind of top of mind of like, huh, that's a really interesting language change. If you just take this one word or a phrase and turn it into something else. Yeah. I mean, I think even, you know, even all the terminology for the, the various types of building wastewater, we have stormwater, rainwater, gray water, black water, AC, AC condensate, uh, foundation drainage, uh, you know, again, building folks are more familiar with it, but even still the amount of times that we deal with people who, who, you know, use gray water, black water, reclaimed water, recycled water interchangeably, um, I think is an indication that we need to maybe rethink the terminology a bit. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes we won't even kind of break them down according to those different categories. We'll just say, you know, it's, it's all water or it's used water. And then it's the, the highly purified recycled water. Um, those types of little changes are really helpful or sometimes rather than just, rather than even saying gray water, we'll say this is water from your showers and your laundry. Again, very simple. It cuts right to it. It doesn't force people to have to figure out like, wait, which, which category is that? Does that fit in here? Does that fit in there? Um, and so there's a lot of different examples like that. I mean, honestly, going even beyond water, yeah. one of the other things we do, one of the things we do as a company is we also produce high quality soil amendments. So we're actually taking the organics out of the wastewater and then turning that into soil products. Um, you know, the, the industry term for that is biosolid, uh, which is for treated sludge. Uh, again. I think that term is in big need of a rebrand, uh, because biosol doesn't necessarily sound super friendly. So we just say things like upcycled wastewater organics or even, you know, organic soil products made from wastewater. Again, just a lot easier for people to understand and meeting them where they're at. And, you know, I can, uh, I can keep going down the list, but I feel like your listeners are probably tired of of me talking about all the fun terms we get to deal with on a daily basis. Yeah. No, that's, that's just super interesting examples. I, I, I really love that. And there's examples across, across industries. I've been, I've been getting really deep into copywriting actually, and like read the, uh, what's that book called the copywriter's manual from like 1940s when they did all those magazine ads, right? They were sending those out in the, in, in the mailers and, uh, Sugarman, I think was the guy's name. It was just, it's so interesting to see kind of how if you're captivating enough and you speak people's language in the right way, and you're solving a core problem. Um, you can sell, you can sell what you're trying to sell. Um, hundred percent. Yeah. I want to take a quick, uh, left turn into something you said earlier. You were, you came from the federal government, you went into water. Like what is the, let's go back all the way. It's kind of like rewind to the beginning. If you're sitting as Aaron, CEO of Epic Clean Tech and looking back to kind of your, let's go back to when you were like first raised. Is there a particular moment in time that if you look back now as, as, as a through line, you're like, Hey, this is like the one moment that I started caring about water or this particular thing now impacted or affected the way that I like look at the world. Is there anything, walk us through that storyline. I think it's always interesting hearing how founders got to where they are. Yeah. Well, the, the, when you, when you, when you started going into the line of questioning, my mother's a psychologist and I thought we were going to be like, you know, let's talk about your, let's talk about your mother. Um, <laughs> well, she would love that. But, um, yeah, look, my story, uh, my journey into water to, is not a straight line at all. Um, I think, you know, when I was little, I wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, 
So I always had sort of an environmental bent to me. So I used to read books by Jane Goodall. I was obsessed with Steve Irwin. Uh, I wrote a letter to Jane Goodall, actually, um, when I was young. Uh, she never wrote back. My friend, it was an assignment. We had to write to uh, one of our heroes. My friend wrote to Wolfgang Puck, uh, and Wolfgang Puck sent some chocolates to him. So um, cool. I was like, man, maybe I shouldn't have written to Jane Goodall. should have written to a chef. <laughs> so veterinarian. Um, then I actually did want to become a chef. Um, so that was something I was fixated on all through high school. Um, I briefly flirted with becoming a rabbi. Uh, I studied history and religious studies. Then I, then I kind of decided I wanted to go into politics. And so, you know, my college career was spent making sure that no one ever got a photo of me holding a beer. Um, cause I thought that would derail my future political ambitions. And then I did work in federal politics and, uh, the genesis of Epic, uh, actually started with two of my co-founders, uh, out of Israel and had Desi they were working with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to design toilets. Um, you know, there's several billion people around the world don't have access to clean water, reliable sanitation. And the Gates Foundation challenge was basically designed around this idea that can we do for water, wastewater, what cell phones did for telecommunications, which is to say telecom, we develop poles and wires. That's how we communicated. Then we eventually went to cell phones and then many parts of the world were able to skip over that pole and wire phase and go directly to these decentralized forms of telecommunication. Can we do that with water, wastewater? So my co-founders were designing toilets uh, for the Gates Foundation. They were presenting at a conference in California where in the audience that day was my third co-founder, uh, Igor. Um, so Igor, for full disclosure, is also my father. Uh, and my father was trained in the Soviet Union in the, in the aerospace program. And you know, he came to this country, moved into the building sciences, and for the last 40 years, been designing high performance buildings. He saw these Israeli entrepreneurs wowing the audience with their toilet innovations and said, I wonder if we can scale that up into a building. Uh, at that point, uh, I was brought in. I left federal politics to be the middleman between my father's engineering company and this Israeli scientific company. Uh, and my job was just to figure out if, if there was a there there or what we were trying to do. And this is the end of 2014. And so being new to water, um, having no technical or engineering background, um, actually probably a pretty horrible engineer. Um, I just spent all my time talking to anyone and everyone who had even a tangential connection to what it is that we were trying to do. I spoke to academics. Uh, I would go to conferences. I mean, I went to farmers markets and, you know, stopped by these stalls and asked them, Hey, would you use, you know, recycled wastewater organics on your crops? And after talking to so many different people, what I started to realize was that not only was what we were trying to develop not a bad idea, but in many ways, the industry was moving this way. You know, when you, when you sort of look at the magnitude of the problem, aging infrastructure, urban population growth, the fact that the rate in which we're adding new buildings to our global building stock is like building another New York City every single month from now until 2060, we just have to do things differently when it comes to water and wastewater. And so, um, I think, you know, my story, as you can see, is a little bit all over the place. Um, but I think the fact that I didn't know what I didn't know uh, is actually part of our, I think, our secret sauce as a company. All four of our co-founders came from outside of the water sector. And I think we were just naive enough to think that we could enter this industry. And, you know, it's obviously been a journey. We've been doing this for a while. And like we're really starting to get a lot of exciting traction in the last two years. But it, it was a journey. Um, so, you know, I think my background hopefully is testament to the fact that there's a lot of backgrounds that qualify someone to come into the water industry. And actually sometimes being unqualified is, it's, is the best advantage. That's such an inspiring story. I mean, there's, there's so many elements there that, that are, that are awesome, right? From your mom being a psychologist to your dad being a building engineer, um, all the way to you not really knowing anything around engineering or water and then being able to kind of ask those, ask those quote unquote dumb questions, right? You're, you're, you don't, you don't know what you don't know. And you're, you're figuring that out, which just makes so much sense in actually building out a model that does solve a core problem because through you exploring this map, you're able to basically find what that solution was. That's, that's, that's awesome, man. That's really, really cool. It's, uh, it's been, it's been, it's been an adventure for sure. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where. When I was younger, the whole notion of going into business, you know, you're in college, you know, I had all the friends who were really good at math and science and they're studying econ and finance and they're the ones who are going to go to Wall Street. And I'm like, oh, those are the kids who go to business, you know, 
I'm going to go to the humanities. I'm going to be a rabbi or politics or this and that. And it was only until I got a little bit older that I realized that how flawed that thinking was. And, you know, being a generalist, being someone who's just curious is honestly sometimes the single best background to get into business. And, you know, I think you use the word curious. I think that, that, that is definitely something I, I, I pride myself on. Imposter syndrome comes to mind. Um, we've had that conversation a lot in like the founder community and even, even in Silicon Valley, as you probably know, in not being an engineer, not understanding anything in, in water when you first kind of entered, how did you combat that? And, and you said this before, right? That there is room for other founders, for other people to come in and actually explore the water space. For those of you out there listening and you do have imposter syndrome where you don't know enough about water, you're not an engineer. Um, how did that feel, Aaron? And like, what did, what did you do to, to kind of combat that? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, it, it's definitely something I felt a lot, especially in the early days, uh, because, you know, I'm going to conferences and I'm in rooms with people, uh, and there's a lot of terms being thrown around that I've never heard of. Um, you know, you get around to a bunch of technical folks and they start talking about BOD and TSS and COD and, um, there's, it's inevitable that you're going to be, you're going to feel out of your element there. And, and, and again, I, I had people point blank. I, I mean, the, the number of people who told me with no hesitation that what we were trying to do, uh, would never happen or that was technically infeasible or the regulations would prevent it. Um, again, I think I'm lucky that I grew, I, you know, I grew up in a household of refugees and immigrants to this country who, um, know what challenges look like, who, who have been through a lot of adversity. And I think that honestly is part of one of my secret weapons is that I'm not easily phased. Um, I'm very mission driven. Um, but I'd say for anyone who is feeling that, I think embrace it. It just, it's important to recognize that you, you don't know what you don't know. Um, but also, you know, to not necessarily take everything at face value. Uh, so, you know, I think <laughs> I have a lot of stories about, you know, the early days of, you know, going into pitch meetings with utilities, using all the wrong terminology and like being corrected mid presentation. They're like, that's not what that means. That's not what that means. That chart is totally off. Um, but you know, I think almost a decade later, uh, I can confidently say I know a lot more terms now than I did 10 years ago. And I think that's, that's the goal. It's like, it's, as long as we're always making progress and learning and, and, and embracing that journey, then it's all fun. Yeah. Let's um, jump into kind of how the Epic clean tech product works. Um, walk us through the customer journey from A to B or A to Z, right? You're talking to a data center. Um, you go in there and you probably talk to the facilities manager, like walk, like literally walk us through kind of how does it work? What gets installed and like, what does it also look like? Like, where do you, you tie it into the input water line? Um, how do you feed the water back in? And then like, what happens after? No, it's a great question. I think the, the easiest way to think about what we're doing is that, you know, every community, every state has municipal wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, these are places that collect all the wastewater from a community are treating it to, you know, an acceptable standard. And that water is either reused or it's discharged from nature, or discharged to the ocean. We're taking a lot of those same principles, those same technologies, and we're basically shrinking them down into a, a, a system design and footprint that is designed for buildings. Um, so, you know, what the technology looks like is, I mean, the core piece of the technology, the engine of the system, uh, it's about eight feet tall, six feet wide. I mean, it basically looks like a large appliance. Um, it's, you know, with the, our new system is the Epic One Water System, which, you know, you can look up and as you'll see, uh, it's a very sleek piece of technology. I mean, I think we're trying to kind of create like the iPod of water reuse systems. So you're not going to see all the pumps and valves and everything. It's just very clean looking. And that was all by design again. A customer who is unfamiliar and uncomfortable with wastewater. So we wanted to make it a little less scary. And so it's just a very sexy looking piece of technology. Uh, what we're doing is we're actually tapping into the building's plumbing. So all of those pipes that are collecting the wastewater from your showers, your laundry, your sinks, your toilets, that is normally routed out to the sewer. So all we're doing is putting in a, a three-way valve that w wastewater is then diverted into the system. And then it's just passing through a series of treatment steps. Um, we're using biological treatment. We're using membranes. You know, these membranes, it's a physical barrier. So that the water passes through and all the impurities are pulled out and, you know, little holes that are one one thousandth the diameter of a human hair. So the water is cycling through, you know, biological treatment. It's, it's going through physical membranes. Uh, and then once the water is actually very highly treated at that point, we then disinfect it. 
And we use things like ultraviolet light, uh, like chlorine in some cases, depending on the application. We even put the water through, you know, carbon filters or reverse osmosis. Really, it's just about tailoring the water to what the end use is going to be. Um, and then that water is recycled back up into the building uh, using purple pipes. And for those who don't know, purple pipes is basically the international symbol or recycled water. So if you're walking in the park or you ever see a purple pipe somewhere, that means it is recycled or reclaimed water. Uh, but the water that's ending up in, in people's toilets or going into their laundry or going out to the lawn, you would never know uh, the, the, where that water originated from. It's going to look, smell, and taste just like your normal tap water. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the core uh, technology. I think what's unique about what we do is that we actually produce three outputs uh, from the building water. And one, as I mentioned, is recycled water, and that's kind of the main driver of business. Uh, the second one, as I mentioned before, is soil amendments. So actually taking the organics out of the water, putting it through a process we developed with the Gates Foundation and turning it into this amazing soil, this carbon-rich soil product. So we're actually taking all this carbon and putting it right back in the ground where it belongs. And then the third piece is wastewater heat recovery. Uh, and really what that means is you know, buildings use a huge amount of energy to heat water up. For showers, laundry, dishwashers, all that heat, that energy, you typically send back off into the sewer. So if you're walking on the street on a cold day and you see steam coming up through the grates, that's just energy. That's just heat that we're losing. And by our calculations, were we to recapture all of that wastewater heat in this country, we could power every single electric vehicle on the road. So I think to synthesize what we're doing, you know, we are big believers that there is no waste in wastewater. So we're taking this building wastewater and turning it into just these commodities, clean water, renewable energy, soil amendments, um, and we're doing it all in, in a pretty compact uh, little package. Um, but that's, you know, that's the basics of how it works. And again, you know, a lot of this stuff is still going to be unfamiliar. The treatment process and the terminology um, is, is unfamiliar to a lot of people, but in, 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 in the simplest explanation is we're taking this dirty water, we're using science technology to turn it into pristine clean water. That's super, super cool. I have a, actually a few questions and I want to uh, unpack the, the three outputs that you have, which are super interesting. Sure. Um, the first around the, uh, around the clean water, the purple pipes going back into the recycled water, um, or what'd you call it earlier? The purified water. Um, first question is, do you have to change out these membranes? Is there like from a business model perspective, is there a bit of a subscription service or some sort of a service angle that you have on making sure that the, the epic or the, you called it the epic, epic one. Um, is actually epic one, uh, one water, epic one water, epic, epic one water, um, is, is maintained and, and managed. How does, how does that work? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, so all of these systems generally by regulation are going to require that you have a certified water wastewater operator who is responsible for the system. It doesn't mean that they're in there every day and that they, you know, they have to be in there every week, but you know, it's basically there on the wall that's responsible mm -hmm. for the ongoing operations and maintenance. And again, the reason for that is that you know, even though the, the technologies aren't that complex, there is a special set of education that you need when dealing with wastewater because you're dealing with biology, you're dealing with chemistry. Um, it's slightly more complex than, than some other building systems. So um, the way our business model works is that you know, we're obviously, you know, there's sort of three tranches. I mean, I think one is when we're brought into a project, you know, this is not an off-the-shelf item. So there has to be some degree of of the integration with the architects, the engineers, the contractors. So sort of there's a, a bit of a design consulting sort of engagement. And sometimes that's packaged in with the actual sale of the system. But we're providing that support, helping design the system. We then provide the actual technology. And then the third piece, which is kind of on the service side, is that we actually have water wastewater operators on our team that operate these systems into perpetuity. Um, so that's, you know, can be an or a multi-year contract. And we are just making, or we are responsible for making sure that the system is working as intended. It's producing pristine water uh, and that, you know, all of the different regulatory requirements are, are, are being checked. Um, and again, you don't have to work with us for that. You know, you can go out and hire your own operators, but what we've found, and again, this is a theme you'll, you'll hear me kind of talk about a lot, but water and wastewater, given that it's relatively new territory for a lot of folks, um, it can be daunting. And so what we are doing is kind of simplifying the entire water reuse approach. And that's why we built this one-stop shop approach as a company where we can literally help with everything from the initial concept and exploration phase. Does this work for my project? 
all the way to we're going to run this system for the next 10 years. And what that ensures is that there's just one responsible party making sure that these systems are delivered and operated correctly. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the business model for us. So, you know, you asked about the membranes, um, you know, the membranes themselves need to be replaced maybe once every seven, 10 years. Uh, okay, they're wow. not, they're not a high ticket item. They're very, very robust. And, you know, again, building wastewater compared to a lot of industry compared to a dairy or a, or, you know, oil, um, oil production or meat processing, um, our wastewater is a lot simpler. Uh, and so I think for these membranes, it's like swimming in the shallow end uh, versus some of the, the tougher to deal with wastewaters. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Let's move to the, to the second output you had mentioned is nutrients for, for kind of agriculture, for the, for, for the um, plants that you have. I just, I kind of envision like after you're finished drinking a Keurig or a coffee filter, like the coffee comes out in this little bucket, like, do you just pull this thing out and you can like dump it in your, in your garden? Do you guys go and pick it up? Does it automatically get pushed out to what does water the kind of gardening? How does, how does that part of it work? Yeah, no, it's excellent question. So, um, you know, in the, again, we don't do, we don't do the soil recovery in every single project. We only do that on what are called black water projects where we have a lot of organics. So when we're actually mm -hmm. tapping into toilets and, and kitchen sinks and dishwashers, anywhere where you have a, a high organic content, but it's literally a, a piece of equipment that uh, takes up about one parking spot. And really what it is, is just a fancy filter. So we are literally pulling the solids. We're sifting them out of the water. We are compressing them. And then they are put in special odor control containers that we, as a company, we come pick up. So we will actually come to these buildings. We, we will collect a full bin and swap it in for an empty one. I mean, very similar to folks who are going to come pick up your trash, your recycling, uh, your compost. We are bringing these solids to our own Epic Clean Tech facilities or, you know, maybe some type of partnering with a, an existing composting facility and we are doing our magic. I mean, we are basically taking these, these solids, you know, could be coming from five different buildings. We process it together. And then the output is this, again, super carbon rich soil material that, you know, we can do a lot of different things with. It can go into parks. Uh, it can go into gardens. I mean, some of the products we work on, they have a lot of landscaping on the project. We can actually use their own products. Um, I mean, the soil produced from their own wastewater right on site. Um, and then we have some really exciting ideas for some direct to consumer products, uh, where, you know, you could have a potted plant in your home that was made from upcycled wastewater organics. Uh, but again, part of us simplifying everything for our customers is that we handle all of that because, uh, candidly, a lot of these buildings, you know, you have a, a, a nice high rise apartment building. They don't necessarily all also want a fertilizer factory uh, in their basement. So we, we, we take that off site. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. That's super interesting. Um, let's go to the third part, which is the wastewater, um, sorry, the, the waste heat reclamation. And it's so funny. I, I had like never even thought of the fact that you're taking a, a warm shower, you're washing a dishwasher and all that hot water just goes down the drain. Um, what is, what does that look like in terms of like capturing the, you just have like a heat pump that captures that water and then turns a, turbine to put like energy back in a battery or what is what is that energy reclamation or recapturing the heat actually look like so we are using heat exchangers um and, and again you know I, I i talked about it a little bit but all of this energy that we're using to heat water up um you know that can it sometimes makes up a pretty good percentage of the building's overall energy usage and what we found is you know we're collecting these collecting this wastewater this heated wastewater in our tanks that water is coming in at you know 80 degrees, let's say. Uh, what we're doing is we're taking that 80 degrees, we're using heat exchangers, we're just transferring that energy to the city water. So again, we're still bringing in drinking water from the city for all of these different, what are called potable applications. So that's going to be everything from your kitchen sinks, your showers, um, anywhere where you're going to have, you know, direct uh, kind of contact with the water. Um, you're still bringing in city water. So let's say you're going to take a shower. You turn on the shower that's holding in that city water. That city water is generally about 55 degrees. So we're doing it basically saying, okay, let's just take the heat from this wastewater that's going to come into our tanks anyways. We'll use heat exchangers to just preheat that city water, that cold city water coming in. And just by preheating the water a few degrees, we can produce huge 
energy savings in the building hot water energy needs. Um, and some projects we're looking at, you know, we're able to reduce their hot water energy needs by upwards of 35%, which represents, you know, a few percentage points of the building's entire energy footprint. And if you're talking about a big building, I mean, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars on utility savings every single year, just by, just by basically uh, repurposing the heat that they're already producing. And, and let's, let's combine that figure. You said 30% heat um, decrease in the building. What, what kind of saving, putting all this together, what kind of savings do you have from a water standpoint? You, I think you had mentioned, so 95% at the beginning of the call? Yeah, it can be up to 95%. Again, you know, some buildings it'll be 30, some buildings it'll be 90, there's a big range. But, you know, I think generally what we're trying to do um, is produce an ROI for our projects of just a few years. Meaning you invest that upfront capital into bringing us in. After a few years, you know, if you compare that to if you had just done a conventional setup where you're just pulling water in and sending wastewater out, um, that's going to, it's going to pay for itself relatively quickly. And, you know, our goal is under seven years, but in some cases it's even faster. I mean, we have some projects where it's going to pay for itself on, you know, year one. Um, and partly because, you know, every one of these large projects, especially for new construction, you know, beyond actually building the building and getting it up and running, every single project is paying what are called impact fees. Um, and those, you know, are water connection fees, sewer connection fees. And basically what the utility is doing is saying, you know, we have this, we have this infrastructure we've already built. You're going to be drawing, you know, a, a million gallons a year and then sending X amount of gallons into our sewer system. So we're going to charge you this amount of dollars um, to be able to accommodate this added uh, capacity. Um, what we're able to do is come in with these buildings and say, well, actually, we're going to be using 50% less water and sending 50% less wastewater by recycling our water on site. And then we get corresponding reductions in those impacts. So not only are we saving the money up, but we're also saving them on an ongoing basis. Because again, your monthly water and sewer bills, um, they're going to be reduced. You're using less water and you're sending less wastewater into the sewer. So I think, you know, you can kind of point to a lot of different places where we're able to, to reduce that cost. And then of course, you know, the, the other piece is, you know, helping them to achieve their sustainability certifications, getting them lead points, whatever the metric is that they're using, we can generally help them get pretty far along in, in really demonstrating that they're doing more than most buildings when it comes to um, their sustainability credentials. I want to pull on something you said uh, earlier when you were going through your founder story. You had said that the, the technology was initially conceived while, while your other two co-founders were at the Gates Foundation. And this word decentralization popped up, right? They're, they were trying to do what they did for toilets, what you saw with cell phones, being able to leapfrog um, development. If you were to kind of look at vision, right? You, I think you said earlier that a new, a new York city is built every single month up until the year 2060, if I'm, if I'm correct. Uh, what does your worldview look like with, with Epic clean tech? What are you guys trying to do? If you just were to fast forward come 2060, um, what's, what's the optimistic worldview of Aaron in, in his mind of kind of what the, what the world looks like? It's a great question. I mean, this, that's, a, that's like a, it's like a question from my psych, psychologist mom. What does Aaron look like in 2060? Um, yeah, look, I think, you know, one of our goals as a company is to, to get us closer to a reality where communities everywhere have access to clean water, reliable sanitation. You know, what we know is that the way we've designed our cities for the last 250 years, you know, when it comes to water and wastewater, which is largely based on the centralized paradigm, which is to say, you know, all buildings and homes are connected to a central network, which is connected to a central facility. Um, that approach is just not going to scale with the rate at which our population is growing, at which industry is growing. Um, so we need to do things differently. So our goal is to do for the water and wastewater industry. I mean, we use the, the analogy of telecom, but I think another example is, is energy. You know, I think for a long time, our energy was again, focused on the centralized model of coal plants or nuclear plants or hydro plants, at the centralized level that are creating energy and sending it out to a big grid. But then, you know, about 20 years ago, we really started transitioning to a more distributed model where we had rooftop solar, we had wind farms, we had hydro, all of these different approaches, which were on a replacement of centralized infrastructure, but basically allowed us to diversify our energy supply portfolio. So we had decentralized and centralized working together, which not only increased our capacity, allowed us to do it faster, and it gave us more resilience 
when we have shocks to the system. Uh, and we're seeing more of those shocks in the form of fires uh, and, you know, insane winter storms, mm -hmm. um, all of the different things that we see on the news all the time. So I think our goal is to help transition the water industry, kind of have them. We, we want to help accelerate water's solar movement, do for the water industry what solar did for energy. Um, and we think that that's going to uh, allow us to accelerate more communities around the world having access to clean water and sanitation. And, you know, I think my goal is to, to make a, a very significant dent into that very, um, the tragic figure about the amount of people who don't have access to clean water and sanitation around the world. And, and, and honestly, you know, when I look at the contribution we want to make as a company, I don't necessarily think we are going to be, we are the only ones who are going to be out there doing this. But if we can help catalyze that movement, you know, what we like to call the water reuse revolution here at Epic, if we can get cities to kind of rethink how they are designed and to say, oh, look, San Francisco, they've, you know, they have dozens of projects that are recycling their own water and that makes that city stronger and more resilient to shocks. That would be uh, a huge success for me. Um, and I think that's, that's what we are in the early stages of doing here as a company. But I think, you know, even in our, our young tenure, we've, we've done a pretty good job. Inspiring. That's awesome. Um, the last question I ask all of our guests, do you have a particular book or movie or TV show that has given you the overview effect, changed your, changed your way that, that you look at the world? Um, or it could be related to water. Hmm. Well, I mentioned at the outset that I wanted to become a rabbi. So I like, should I say the Torah? You could um, totally. No, that, well, A, that is an important book in my life. Um, oh, that's a good question. Cause I, I, I bounce around a lot uh, when I read, when I'm reading different things, but yeah, I think I'll be kind of boring and go to a water industry book. But, uh, a book that I really like is called water 4.0. Uh, it is by, uh, professor David Sedlak from UC Berkeley. And what I really like about the book is it just, it gives a very good overview of the history of our water and wastewater infrastructure. You know, it talks about water 1.0, you know, when we started to, uh, you know, transport water, there was like sort of the, the beginning of, of centralized infrastructure, you know, water 2.0 is when we actually started treating some of that wastewater. Water 3.0 is when we actually started treating, uh, treating the drink water. Um, and then, you know, putting in even more of the central infrastructure and then water 4.0 is the moment that we're in now where we are revisiting the entire paradigm. Um, we are doing things like moving from a solely centralized model to a decentralized model. We are doing things like creating no new sources of water, whether that's atmospheric water generation, whether that's desalination, um, whether that's, you know, new forms of water purification where we're taking what is called sewage and turning it into drinking water. But then another piece, and I know this is a piece you're really familiar with, is the whole notion of smart water, mm -hmm. of taking all of this technology that we have available to us today and in terms of software and applying that to what has traditionally been a pretty antiquated industry. You know, I think I, I heard the term years ago at a conference that the, the water industry is still run by the clipboard army, uh, mm -hmm. which is to say folks who are going and, you know, looking at a water meter, writing it down on a piece of paper, taking that back to an office and manually inputting that into a computer. You know, we have smart devices that you can clip onto a meter. Uh, we have smart devices that can, you know, integrate all of the different sensors and give us real time knowledge as to what water quality is against something you are very familiar with. So taking all of this, you know, this technology that is we're seeing sweeping the rest of the world and bringing that to the water industry. So, uh, that was a very long answer to a simple question. Uh, but, but water 4.0, it's a book that, um, really helped me when I entered the industry. And it's actually a book that every single new person who joins our team. Uh, is given on their first day. Awesome. We'll have to, I'll definitely put that on your profile when we, uh, when we launch this episode live. Aaron, thanks a ton for coming on Liquid Assets. And for all of those of you out there, if you want to listen to Liquid Assets, you can find us at liquidassets.cc or anywhere else you get your podcasts or on YouTube today.